In Wednesday's edition of 2020 Daily Trail Markers, a number of Democratic presidential hopefuls are releasing the details of their climate plans ahead of a series of town halls on the topic of climate change. Earlier this week, Senators Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, and Elizabeth Warren, as well as Mayor Pete Buttigieg and former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development Julian Castro all unveiled their proposals. They address everything from achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions to rejoining the Paris Climate Accord. Let's bring in CBS News 2020 campaign reporters Zach Hudak, Tim Perry, Stephanie Ramirez and Jack Termit. Zach covers Senator Elizabeth Warren, Mayor Bill de Blasio and Tom Steyer. Tim covers the campaigns of Beto O'Rourke, Julian Castro, and Governor Steve Bullock. Stephanie covers Senator Kamala Harris. And Jack covers the campaigns of Mayor Pete Buttigieg, Senator Cory Booker, and Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Welcome to all of you. My cup runneth over with <laughs> campaign knowledge tonight. Thank you so much. Um, Zach, I, I want to start with you. Senator Elizabeth Warren is giving some credit for her plan to uh, former candidate and Washington Governor Jay Inslee. What are some of the parallels that we're seeing there? Elaine, Senator Warren's borrowing from Governor Ensley's 10-year action plan for 100% clean energy. Like Ensley, Warren wants to decarbonize our electricity, our vehicles, our buildings. But Warren's not new to the climate debate here. Mm -hmm. Five of her previous policy proposals have specific portions of them, or they're almost entirely for climate change. Um, one of them on public lands, one for the military, one on trade practices, one on green manufacturing, and one on disclosing risks mm -hmm. about climate change. That said, the $3 trillion that she is now pledging to spend on it is still dwarfed by the $9 trillion that Ensley was saying he would spend. Right. Um, so Bill de Blasio does not actually have a plan listed on his website, but he's pointing to achievements as mayor of New York. Walk us through that. The constant pitch from the mayor and his staff is, if I've done it here, I can do it anywhere. Now, earlier this year in New York, he passed a law that fines building owners if they don't retrograde their buildings so that they don't uh, contribute to climate change. Mm -hmm. He's also signed an executive order that uh, commits New York City to the, uh, to the standards set in the Paris Climate Agreement. Mm -hmm. But, like you said, he has no plan laid out to this point. Nonetheless, his campaign told me today he will have one in the coming weeks. Hmm. All right. Well, Tim, Julian Castro and Beto O'Rourke seem to have different approaches here to addressing climate change. How exactly do their plans differ? So I'd say the biggest difference between the two plans are price tag and timeline. Mm. Um, so I should first note that Beto was the first candidate of the 2020 candidates to release a climate plan. He releases back at the end of April mm -hmm. um, in this cycle, but price tag. So whereas Beto would like to mobilize $5 trillion in federal, state, local, and private investment, um, Julian Castro is calling for $10 trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, and their timelines are a bit different. Uh, Castro is like Inslee, where he wants 10 years of clean energy, but he also was calling for net zero emissions by uh, the year 2045, whereas Beto was calling for the same goal by the year 2050. Mm -hmm. However, they are also the same in some areas. Um, Beto and Castro are both calling to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord on day one of their administrations, and they both acknowledge the need for pre-disaster mitigation. Uh, just yesterday, Castro called for $500 million annually to be spent on some of these communities that are in the front lines mm -hmm. of uh, some natural disasters or effects of climate change. Another area where they differ, Beto made an amendment to his climate plan uh, where he spoke with a lot of farmers. Uh, he acknowledges the fact that since this is an issue that affects them heavily, they should also be a part of the solution. So he is calling for uh, huge increase, increases in research and development uh, for new agricultural technologies. Interesting. And he's also calling for farmers to create incentives for carbon farming. Hmm. Uh, and last thing I'll say, uh, Castro and Beto both acknowledge the effects of environmental justice. And just today during the climate town hall, Castro said that communities of color, black and brown communities, and poor communities tend to be at the front lines of some of the effects of climate. Uh, but they're also some of the people who can afford it the least. So he is calling for more enforceable measures. He wants to um, 
create legislation, new civil rights legislation that would prevent environmental dis discrimination. And he also wants states that receive EPA funding to create um, environmental, uh, to measures to prevent environmental discrimination. Mm. So last thing I'll say, Castro has only released the first two parts of a series of five parts for his climate plan. So we should be on the lookout to see what else he offers. Huh. All right. Well, Stephanie, let me ask you about Senator Kamala Harris. She has a $10 trillion plan and is also looking back to her time as a prosecutor to take major polluters to court. How are climate activists reacting to her plan? Hi, Elaine. Well, I can tell you the League of Conservation Voters are supportive, as they are with a lot of plans introduced. They had sent a statement out earlier this morning, though, saying that her record on fighting for justice and holding polluters accountable shines through in this plan. That was a quote. And we just watched her defend it vigorously on the CNN Climate Town Hall. We'll be combing through what she said there, but I can tell you on the holding polluters accountable portion, that's one of five pillars in her plan introduced today. And the campaign is really highlighting this section, discussing a time when Harris, uh, as a prosecutor, went after oil companies, not properly following the rules for underground storage tanks. There's several more cases they highlight. But before this, uh, the camp campaign also plays up Harris uh, starting San Francisco's first environmental protection unit to go after polluters. So following in that vein, her plan to hold polluters accountable lays out groundwork that supports prosecution if necessary. And this includes support Supporting the DOJ's Environmental and Natural Resources Division, funding the EPA's Office of Enforcement and Compliance Insurance. And this is to support uh, polluters being held accountable on the federal level. And with that, she's also proposing climate pollution fees, as well as making companies prove that they are obeying or following safety standards so that there's something to hold them on. Elaine? Hmm. All right. Uh, Jack, let me ask you. Mayor Pete Buttigieg and Senator Cory Booker both have detailed plans. Is this the first time we're seeing detailed proposals from both from both men? In terms of detailed proposals, yes. But this is something that they each have talked about a lot on the on the campaign trail. Uh, for example, Mayor Pete Buttigieg frequently talks about uh, climate change as a security issue as part of his stump speech on the campaign trail, uh, and you see that evident in the more detailed proposal he released today. Uh, he proposes an increase to the budget in the Department of Defense uh, in regards to their climate planning and regional preparedness. And then also, he frequently talks about on the campaign trail putting a price on carbon, and that's also in the plan that he has. And, that, and within that plan there, he also suggests rebating the revenue from that price on carbon back to American citizens. Uh, moving over to Senator Booker, he also in April proposed an environmental justice agenda as part of his Justice for All tour at the end of April. And here you see in his plan released yesterday the proposal to create an environmental justice fund. And part of that environmental justice fund would include primarily improving infrastructure around water service lines uh, that would, you know, service residential areas, school areas and other communities. And then more broadly for Senator Booker, he's frequently said on the campaign trail that he would basically view every issue through the lens of climate and how climate change will affect every other issue there. Well, we know that the issue of climate change is critically important to a lot of Democratic voters, especially young voters. Zach Hudak, Tim Perry, Stephanie Ramirez, and Jack Turman, I am sure I will be speaking to all of you in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Thank you all.